Hey, Fred, am I on? Can y'all hear me? Woo, good morning. OK, good. I really want this to be interactive as much as possible, um, because it makes it much more fun for everyone to learn from each other and share ideas. So first of all, um, really, really, really excited to be here and a little bit nervous because I've never presented to as many people as all of you. So that is my coexisting truth. You all know about coexisting truths? I'm totally excited and I'm totally nervous all at the same time. So this is one of the core tenets of compassionate management, which I'm going to be talking about today. So think about some of your coexisting truths right now. Like maybe you really wanted an egg and they only had bagels or something like that, and you're really happy they had bagels with that yummy cream cheese. So it's all good, coexisting truths. So we're going to talk today about how to manage a creative team. First, I want to give you a little quick down dirty on me. Um, I have a BFA from School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And uh, that was about a 1,000 years ago before computers. So I did mechanicals. Anyone remember mechanicals? Uh-huh, Ruby Lith, the stat camera. I was awesome on the stat camera. Um, and so by the time I started designing, right like a year after I got out of school, computers started to happen for real. And so I had to learn it on my own, which was pretty terrifying. Um, and I had no one to teach me, and so uh, I, I fell on my face quite a few times, but I did it. I was an okay designer. I was not outstanding. And as a true creative, I'm a perfectionist. So it was pretty frustrating. So after eight and a half-ish years of designing, being an art director and designing, the owner of the company where I was at the time, Jay Crew, as a graph designer, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and he asked me to manage the creatives. So I thought, what the hey, I'm not really happy doing what I'm doing. I'm just going to jump off this cliff and go for it. And again, terrifying, coexisting truth. Totally excited to try something new and completely terrified that I'm going to fall on my face. So I did it. That opportunity took me from the valley up to the top of the mountain, and I suddenly realized why we were always late because it was a domino effect of getting the information from the team before us and the team before and the team before, and it was just a domino effect, so I started streamlining and making things more efficient, and lo and behold, I fell in love with Excel, which was a shock, and um, as you can, yes, it usually gets a good giggle, because it's true, like, really, a creative in Excel? I am the very epitome of coexisting truths. I am fully a creative spirit, artist, singer, designer, and absolutely love business. I really love crunching numbers, even as I'm horrible at math. Um, I love Excel for that reason. And so the two, to me, are what make um, the greatest job for me is to marry the two. So that's why I ended up going into creative operations for 20-something years. Um, I've had this really wild thing happen recently where I just accepted a position and I'm now currently the chief operating officer of an incredible nonprofit called Dress for Success Worldwide. Um, it has pretty much nothing to do with creative, as I have done for the past 27 years of my career. And, coexisting truth, it totally feeds into all of the things that I love, business and creativity and empowering people and helping the world. So it's a pretty wild ride I'm on. I'm on my fifth career, and I'm only uh, 47. So you go, everybody. Just keep reinventing yourself over and over and over. And um, so that's pretty much where I'm going to go from here. I want to explain where compassionate management came from. I gave it that name. After all these years of managing and falling on my face repeatedly and having one horrible boss after another, anyone ever have a horrible boss? Uh-huh. Wow. Wait. There was like one person who didn't raise their hand. Um, and so I kept learning, like, OK, never want to do that, never want to do that. Wow, that felt pretty crappy. OK. And oh my god, that was awesome. Let me write that one down and do that. And so through all those years of um, being treated poorly and every now and again being treated what I consider right, um, and then managing my, doing the management myself and being set up for failure many, many times, um, falling on my face and getting up and realizing how much I loved it, I also realized that no one cares about my career more than me, nor should they. It's my responsibility to figure out what I want for my career. It's my responsibility to figure out if I want to be promoted, if I want to take on that other project, if I want to do that thing. So all of this compassionate management is a culmination of all these 27 years of experience into one, because I very strongly believe that compassion is missing from the work world. And who better to bring compassion to the work world than us, you know, creative folk? We're all kind of woo-woo anyway, so we might as well embrace it and bring the heart into the workplace. You know what I'm saying? All right. 
So let's dive in. All right. Coexisting truths of the creative person. So this is a, a foundation for, I'm going to say foundation a lot, so you can just, you know, go with that, please. Um, the coexisting truths of the creative person. Have y'all ever been called sensitive? Yeah, so that was sort of the, um, uh, the soundtrack of my childhood. You're so sensitive. Yes, I am. And so what I ask us to do in this room is identify all of these stereotypes of our creative teams. Wait, let me just see a show of hands. How many people are managing creative teams? Okay, awesome. Right audience for the right presentation, okay? <laughs> so, um, when you're feeling totally frustrated with your creative person and like, oh, she's so sensitive, also recognize the other piece of that truth. The other piece, which is, she can more, more, uh, she's more enabled to understand the customer experience because of her sensitivity. It can be really annoying to have to manage someone who's very, very extremely sensitive, but she's not too sensitive. She's just the right amount of sensitive because she also gets what the customer could be experiencing. So it's a, it's a pro. Intense. How about that one? Anyone ever hear lighten up? Okay, that was the total soundtrack of my life. And I'm never going to lighten up. I'm an intense and serious person, and most of the designers I've worked with and managed are intense and serious people. It's a real gift that they bring to the party because it feeds their passion for their work. If they're shallow and light and whatever, they're going to do whatever work. So their intensity is actually a bonus. Oops, my glasses. There we go. Ditsy. Oh, she's so spacey. He doesn't pay attention. Why doesn't he follow the deadlines? Because he's busy being comfortable with the abstract, which is a really wonderful, wonderful thing for a creative to be comfortable with. So just going through this list of an artsy. I used to love being called artsy until I looked it up, and then I realized it was not a compliment. <laughs> and so um, what we really want to think about is that, yes, artsy means you just don't fit. Darn tootin' I don't fit. And that's why I come up with really neat creative solutions. I might work in a corporation. I might need to wear that sheath dress with the little shoes and the blazer and all that. And that's fine. I can carry that. I can do it. And I'm going to bring my heart here, and I'm going to do creative, innovative work because that's who I am. That's who I am. And so that is a perfect segue for talking about the responsibility of the creative manager, all of you. We've just had some insight into your team. Now let's have some insight into you. What your role is, is to model what you want to see from your team. Yes, we want creativity, innovation, strategic solutions, got to be in brand alignment, all of that. What about the other stuff? What about partnership, respect, compassion, collaboration, all of that? So while we might have that on the job description, how are we using both of these pieces? Again, it's a kind of a coexisting truth, but not really. It's the two areas that everyone needs to deliver on that I might put under the entire umbrella of professionalism, um, although I wrote professionalism on the second line, but you get the idea. It's all around professionalism for a creative. We need to deliver in both areas. Whereas an accountant might only need to deliver on line number two, and their line number one would be, you know, do the correct math. Um, creatives have a, a, a much broader role and responsibility, and that makes our jobs as managers that much more challenging. Are you with me? All right, here we go. It's very loud, right? Is it too loud? No? Okay, great. So, when, uh, when you think of the word compassion, do you think of love? Do you think of a dad helping his son who got a boo-boo? Maybe a friend helping a friend who got an F on a test or a boyfriend or something. These are the images of compassion. Anyone want to throw out any other images they think of when they hear the word compassion? No? I thought I heard someone. No. All right. <laughs> all right, you guys are going to have to speak up in a little bit, all right? We've got some mics back there, so I want to do some interactive uh, role playing in a few minutes. So now, when you see these images, do you think of compassion? always gets a giggle. And there's always at least one person who goes, no. And the reason why is because we are taught to not bring compassion to the workplace. Someone in another audience saw this woman in the, in the, the big vertical picture and said, she's angry. And I said, heck yeah, she's angry. Let's figure out why. Let's have compassion for why she's so angry and help her work through it. It's a very foreign concept for a lot of people. Does it feel foreign for anyone in here? 
Okay, if it feels far and raise your hand. Oh, wow, all right, we're done, excellent. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going and see if you get anything out of it. So, <laughs> compassionate management is a management style. It is consistently and continuously looking for ways to experience what everyone else is feeling and what you are feeling. This is what usually um, happens is people say, okay, well, I got what my boss is feeling because I want to manage my boss. So I have to, I, now I know how to manage up and manage my boss. And, and now I'm going to get into the head of my team and, and manage them and manage them. And then they're left feeling really kind of tapped and, and sapped dry. So you also have to have compassion for yourself. It's what I call mutual compassion. It's really important. You can have compassion for your vendors. You can have compassion for the HR team, finance, your boss, your boss's boss, your team, the person who's reporting to someone on your team. Don't forget yourself. It's key because everything you model, they, your team will pick up and they will start modeling. And that's why it's so important. So how many people in this room feel seen, heard, and valued by their boss and their colleagues? <gasps> I want to work where you all work. <laughs> I have never seen so many people raise their hand. Oh, wow. All right. Well, we'll just keep laughing because really I'm not sure what I can teach you because that's awesome. All right. Here are the three principles of compassionate management. Number one is be yourself. They chose you, so show up. When I worked in-house for all those years, oftentimes, most of the time, I felt like I couldn't really be me. I once had a conversation with someone on my team where he said, you know, I feel really uncomfortable. I love tea and I want to make tea and this whole, you know, I want to do the whole thing with the tea and the little tea ball thing and the, and, and I just, I feel uncomfortable. And I was like, dude, drink your tea, just be yourself. Um, and it was a big deal for him because it was such a corporate environment that he thought people are going to laugh, they're going to be focusing on that instead of his product, because they did. But ultimately, you got to be yourself. So if it's something as simple as tea, imagine bigger issues like management. Number two, trusting your gut. Your gut is your instinct and it's your greatest guide. Your gut takes data from the head, from the heart, mushes it together and spits out the solution. That's called instinct. That's how it works. Number three, own your power. This I learned, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, how owning your power is really comforting. Have you ever felt helpless or frustrated or trapped in a job? Anyone who's felt trapped in a job? Owning your power will help you work through that. And then maybe not get another job immediately, but work through it. A great designer lives by these principles. A really great designer is someone who Okay, great is a, is a sort of random word, but go with me on that. They wear what they want, for example, so they're being themselves. I can't tell you how many times I had to say, um, you can't wear cut-off jeans at work today. Could you, you know, maybe on casual Friday, and could they be a little bit longer, and working with that. Um, so in terms of clothing, and uh, I had once had a designer who wore sunglasses. Every time he'd walk in, he'd sit down, he'd work on the computer with the sunglasses. Finally, I was like, Dude, you smoking? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Everyone's talking about it. And he said, no, I just like my sunglasses. And I said, fine, keep them on. But, you know, it, it raised questions because it was out of the norm. But OK, so he was true to himself. They intuit strategic solutions. So great designers take the head data, which means the statistics and the numbers and the objective on the creative brief and all of that, and then they take the heart space, which is what is the customer experiencing. Oh, look at those textures. Oh my god, that color is gorgeous. Um, I just saw something done this way. And they take those two pieces and they spit out an on-target, on-creative brief, on-brand creative solution. Um, and then number three, they honor their gifts, and that's owning their power. I can't tell you how many designers I've interacted with who said, well, I, I have an idea, of, you know, it's not, it's, the client's not going to like it. You know, that, that whole kind of insecure step away from your own creativity, your own gifts. Have you ever experienced that? So a truly great designer honors themselves, their gifts, gives the client what they want, and gives the client what they know is really the best solution, as an example. So it's, it's these three um, principles of compassionate management that we're going to talk about. Now, I promised in the blurb that I'm going to give you three takeaways, how to have a warm heart towards people, creativity, and process, and a cold eye on the bottom line, 
That's the coexisting truth. Both. You need to have the creative solution and the bottom line. You need to have the people and the bottom line. You with me? OK, great. How to counsel effectively and compassionately, and how to have mutual compassion when the going gets tough. So let's go to the Italian leather couch example. This is how to use compassionate management to have that warm heart towards people, creativity, and process, and the cold eye on the bottom line. Isn't that a tacky looking couch? Right? That's why I chose it. I thought it'd be entertaining. Um, so we had three brands and three creative teams working on the three brands. We had one um, fall ad campaign budget. And it was becoming, um, things were going south. The three different teams were fighting. It was sort of like an auction. One person would say, well, we need to shoot in Nice. And the other person said, well, I need to have you know, Linda Evangelista. And the other person said, I need to have an Italian leather couch in my office. And it was like the bidding was going higher and higher and higher. And I thought, oh my god, what am I going to do with these people? And um, so I had some choices to make. I could have done what, uh, what was suggested. I was given a few suggestions. One suggestion was um, just tell them. Tell them, you're getting that much money, you're getting that much money, you're getting that much money, deal with it. OK, so that's not really my style. I don't like to force things on people, certainly not senior level. Creative people are supposed to be delivering at a senior level. Talk about poor modeling, right? I mean, that would be horrible. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that one. Um, and then the next one was to um, uh, follow what the diva wanted. Anyone ever work with a diva? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so she would have been thrilled, you know, like, oh, yeah, she said this. And I could slink off into my office and be like, OK, let them work it out, you know, and, and just kind of hide. Obviously, that's not my style either. Um, and so there was a third option, which was I was pretty pissed off about the whole thing because they were acting like children. And it was just it was disrupting the whole flow of the department. So I, I could have stormed out like they were doing. Um, but again, that's not my style. So I decided to follow my own my own rules. And I said, OK, let's get really quiet, Rena. Be yourself. Get really quiet and think about this. And use your intuition. And so I, I really thought about it. And my head said, what a bunch of egos. Jeez Louise, let's just replace them all. And my heart said, oh, they just want to be empowered. They all just want to do good work on their brand. They own their brand. And so my, my tummy took these two pieces of information and said, OK, here you go. So I went in, called a meeting with the senior team, and I said, here's our whole budget. Let's figure it out. And I sat back, and I facilitated a cross-channel uh, communication. And it was magnificent. They were like, step off. You're not going to tell us what to do? And I was like, I'm not going to tell you a word. You've got to figure this out, people. And they did. And they sorted it out. And they made decisions based on, there were some terse words, but then it ended up being like a really healthy tension. You know that healthy tension of what's best for the business and which brand should get the most money and why and which one should get the least money and why and wait, maybe it's not about money. Maybe this brand is better to just use Twitter. That happens to be free. Okay, so then this one just needs to have a, a full ad campaign in Vogue and whatever. Okay, that's more money. So they, they really talked it through and they figured it out and it was awesome. That was using my power. Because my power was, I could have been nasty. I could have forced it. My power could have been to just be a wimp and walk away. My power could have been to storm out the door. But instead, I used my power to empower them. And that, I believe, was using my power wisely and with compassion. Because it ended up being a win-win for everyone. They felt lifted up and nurtured. Nurtured. Can you believe I said nurtured in the corporate space? But it's true um, that they felt empowered and excited, and then they owned what they were doing. The, the ad campaigns were awesome, and it just the team in general worked together much more effectively after that. And we stayed on budget, which was awesome. Next example. OK, so you all know what a diva is. Do you know what a divo is? A Devo is a male version of a diva. I believe in equality, so I came up with the name Devo. So how do you use compassionate management to effectively and compassionately counsel someone? Has anyone ever had to counsel a diva or Devo? Yeah, quite a few. Um, and I've had to do it quite a few times. So I'm going to give you an example of one person. And uh, um, I give you, give a, I'm going to give away the end. He's awesome now. And uh, we've referred each other, and we're friends now. So in the beginning, it was uh, pretty exasperating. This super extraordinarily talented person who was sabotaging his success at every minute. 
He was um, rude. He was patronizing. He was condescending. He was shutting people down. He was interrupting meetings. Um, he was giving the clients what he thought they needed, not what they thought they needed, without explanation. Um, it was just all around. And yet, the work he was doing was wow, when it was on strategy. Even when it wasn't on strategy, it was well, and so, but it wasn't on strategy. So how to, um, you know, I had a choice. I could say, you're out of here, dude. Or, you know what, we've already invested this much time, and uh, it's someone I inherited, so it's not like I was able to uh, work with him from the beginning. Um, and so I, I had, again, some choices to make, which is what we all have when we're managers um, in every area of our lives. I could have, uh, let's see. Someone told me to um, tell him this needs to change effective immediately and sustained, ongoing performance change. Now, I happen to love the phrase immediate and sustained. To me, it's very clear. It's, it's very um, no room for interpretation. I love it. I use it. I don't think it makes sense to say you need to change your behavior immediately. Because what happens with that is they change their behavior for two to three weeks, maybe even six weeks, and then they go back to who they are. And then you have mutual resentment. Then you have, like, what's, what was up with that? We already had this conversation. We're back to square one, but it even feels like we're before square one because you were making that commitment. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, someone else suggested that I shame him. Um, yeah, have you ever had that? Yeah. So that never works. That's really counterproductive as far as I'm concerned. Um, it doesn't feel good for me to do it. It doesn't feel good for them to hear it. You know, no one respects you. No one wants to work with you kind of thing. It's just, it's just counterproductive. It's mean. It doesn't make sense. And it doesn't, it doesn't take you in the direction you want to go. So I, I threw that idea out the window. Um, and what I ultimately ended up doing was, again, going back to compassionate management, which is number one, being myself. Now, obviously, I like to talk a lot, so being quiet is hard for me. But number one when you're counseling someone is to um, shut up. And so I had to uh, really you know, sit on my hands and bite my tongue, and I said, dude, what's up? What is going on? You're so self-sabotaging. What's up? And the more I was quiet, the more he began to talk. And then, and then ask me questions, and then I was able to ask him questions like, do you realize how you're presenting yourself? I'm not sure you do. Let me share a scenario with you and really talk it through. So it was exciting because he seemed receptive. We went through this week after week after week, very confidentially. I don't think even to this day anyone knew what was going on because we had to have lots of meetings anyway in my office, you know, my, my cubicle office. Um, but we would go to lunch, we would do whatever. We kept it confidential. And um, when he would do something awesome, like he'd really catch himself, I'd leave a $100,000 bar in his chair. He'd know it would be from me. No one else would know. And it was just kind of a little, you know, uh, thumbs up, quiet thumbs up communication. Um, and then there were times when he would just, oh my God, you're just not getting it, dude. And so we would have these conversations. And after a while, I felt like I was banging my head a little bit against the wall. And maybe this wasn't going to work. And um, I certainly got feedback from HR saying, What's up, Rena? Let's move this party along. And so I, again, I got real quiet. And I said, OK, what needs to happen here? And my head said, move on, cut bait. It's been like seven weeks already. And my heart said, I really see the potential. So my gut spit out, give it a few more weeks. Give it a few more weeks so that you, Rena, know that you've done everything you can to help this person. So do you understand there's this thing about compassionate management is I have compassion for him because I didn't want to fire him. And I have compassion for me. I don't want to fire someone before I'm ready, before I really feel I've done everything I can. So that's a really core part of that mutual compassion. Even as you're going through this, it's not just what a jerk, got to move on, got to get rid of him, or I can't believe I didn't do it. It's, it's both, having that, that mutual compassion. Sure enough, in that last, I gave myself another three weeks or so, Something clicked for him, thank God, and, uh, and suddenly I could see it in the way he was carrying himself, the way he was speaking. Um, I saw him in one meeting where he started down his old path and he went, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and changed his whole approach. And I was like, yes, this is awesome, because I thought, this is, this is going to stick, you know? And it really did, and it was awesome. So I want to clarify something. 
I didn't make that happen. He made it happen. He turned his situation around and ended up being a leader. And I used my power wisely because the only power I had was to follow my heart and my gut to, and my head, you know what I mean, the whole, the whole package to help him as best I could become a true partner, a true collaborative creative partner. And because I stuck with it and followed my heart, somewhere in there, something clicked for him. But even if it hadn't, I still followed my heart, and that's owning my power. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Did it change his work? Yes, because there was, oh, thank you so much. I told I'm not even looking at my notes. A big piece of it was that he wasn't meeting the creative brief strategically. Thank you. What's your name? Newark. Ewan. Whoops, Ewan. Thank you very much. So that's a, the whole key of this example, <laughs> thank you, Ewan, that um, his attitude was definitely, definitely needed to change. And his creative delivery, while they were gorgeous, a lot of the time he was just doing what he wanted to do. So part of the conversation was, how would you feel if you asked someone on your team to give you apples and they gave you oranges with an attitude? You know, bad enough getting oranges, but also with an attitude. And, and, so then he started to think things differently, and then we would go over real time. We had weekly meetings, and real time. In that moment, we'd walk out of a meeting, and I'd be like, you know, we'd go, we'd have a conversation, and I'd be like, what was, it, what was up with that? They asked for apples. You gave them oranges. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. Let's walk through it. Let me show you step by step by step of how you went to oranges which is hard when it comes to creative, because you want to nurture that creative spirit and that creative freedom and that sensitivity. You want to be aware of that sensitivity and that, and that intensity and that passion. You don't want to squash it. And they work for a company. It's not a fine artist who's out there painting whatever they want. So it was, does that answer your question? Because, because of that, he started to deliver more on strategy consistently, and therefore he could model and lead the team much more effectively. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Please, ask more. Oh, no. The work was still as good. It was as good. Why would you say because his attitude changed, his work wouldn't be as good? Say that again? Ah. Okay, so Ewan's question is, and I'm sure I've seen this in younger people, Less, less mature people, actually, when I think about it now. That, um, that there's, I remember being in art school and being really, oof, man, God help those people who I started to work with when I was a junior, junior designer. I was just very, you know, I'm a designer. I went to art school attitude. Um, so with them, and certainly with me at that point, I'm sure, if someone said, no, you need to follow these rules, I would have been like, uh-uh, I'm a creative. I'm a free spirit. Don't tell me what to do. Um, but he was old enough in his, in, his, um, in his maturity, I'm not even talking age, but in his maturity, that he could see the benefit of following the creative brief and delivering work that's on strategy. With him, it worked. I don't know that it would work with everyone. You're right. I think it really has to do with maturity. Does that help? Yeah? All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Layoffs. Anyone ever have to do layoffs? They're so awesome, right? Hate them. <laughs> Torture. So I'll give you an example that I experienced. I joined a company, and three weeks after I joined as the VP of Creative Operations, I was told I had to lay off 20% of the team. Um, that felt really bad. And, uh, and I also felt a little bit taken. You know, they knew it before they hired me. They didn't tell me. Um, and I felt completely trapped because I was the breadwinner. Um, so I said, no, I think we can come up with some other solutions, and here's the total dollar amount, and, uh, you know, and so I, I, I went into my compassionate management, ooh, and I, I meditated, and I thought, and I, what am I going to do here? And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to be myself, and I'm going to propose alternative solutions. 
So I took the total dollar amount and I said, here we could, we could meet it with flexible um, hours and job sharing and we could give the executives, which would have included me, uh, 10, 15 or 20 percent pay cuts. Ooh, that was not well received. Um, and so a bunch of different ideas and all within one week I presented these ideas. By the sixth presentation, the sixth time I presented, um, and, I, and I repeated the, uh, the executive pay cut quite a few times because that felt the most right to me. Um, by the sixth time, I was told, not verbatim, but very clearly, that if I didn't lay off 20% of the team next week, I would lose my job. So I felt trapped. I felt furious. Um, I, to say helpless is kind of an understatement. The economy was crashing. Um, I, I'm the breadwinner, as I said. I, I needed to keep a roof over our heads and food on our plates. And, um, you know, I have a five-year-old, you know what I'm saying? Like, he wasn't five then. So, it, it, he was younger. So, it was, it was a ton of pressure, and I cried. I cried a lot, and I thought about it a lot, and I called friends and family, and, and you know, what do I do? What do I do? And um, one friend said to me, they're going to be laid off no matter what, Rena. And I thought, oh my God, she's right. I could walk out that door with righteous indignation. I'm going to have no part of that, you know what I'm saying? And then they'd all lose their job and I'd be out of a job. What's the point of that? That's not helping anyone. So I, I got real quiet and okay, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to bring compassionate management to this experience for myself and for these people. And I went through the list and um, in partnership with someone who'd been there for many years, we made this list and then I did the layoffs. And in those layoffs, I, um, I was real and I said, I'm so sorry that it has to be this way. I really wish it didn't. And with some of the people I cried a little because I'm a mushball and I was just very authentic and real through the whole thing. And so I beat myself. I followed my gut, which told me to do it with compassion because I really, my head was saying, get the hay out of there, and my heart was saying, oh my God, these poor people. And so that was the solution. Um, sorry, my head was saying you need the money. My heart, my heart was saying, get the hay out of there, because <laughs> I did need the money very badly. And, uh, and it was an awful feeling. And then owning my power was okay. The only power I really have right now is to try to keep my job as long as I can, because I really like to eat and um, do it with compassion, try to help these people as much as I can. And so what happened there, which was really shocking to me, was um, about two weeks after, some of the people I had laid off, who only knew me for what, three weeks at that point, um, called me in friendship to see how I was doing. And I was like, you're calling me? Thank you, how are you doing? And they said, well, you know, this one woman said to me, it was awful and it is awful right now. But you made me feel seen. You made me feel valued. And that made the whole thing easier to take. I, I almost fell off my chair because I, that, that, you know, I, I wanted to do that, but it wasn't conscious. And if I could give that gift to her at that moment, my God, compassionate management is huge. It could really change the world. You know, that's really where I live is, I think it could change the world. So that was what I brought to that experience. Um, and apparently it really helped those people. And so uh, that's where I end on compassionate management with the three examples. Do you have any questions on that? All right. Compassionate management tools. Coexisting truths revisited. We already talked about this as co understanding your designer as a coexisting truth. Now I want you to think about when she's driving you crazy, to think about those coexisting truths. I hate letting people go, and he had every chance to turn this around. The diva has incredible talent and needs to improve her interpersonal skills. So we already pretty much talked about that. You can tweet this if you want. They asked us to put tweeting on here, so I thought I would. The key to coexisting truths is the word and, not but. So when you're thinking about coexisting truths, when you're thinking about how exasperated you are, Write down how exasperated you are, notice that you put the word but in there, cross it out and write the word and. It shifts the whole experience. Next, tone of voice. So let's do this. Nice shirt. Nice shirt. Is the report done? Hey, is the report done? And then here's the most cruel one. Why'd you do that? When somebody says, why'd you do that? 
They have already decided why you did it, and they're calling you stupid idiot, which are curse words in my household. They really haven't identified you as an idiot. There is no room for communication. There's no room for collaboration. There's no room for trust or partnership at all. Here's the key here. Tone of voice changes the meaning of the words. So when you're giving a creative feedback and you're saying, so you tend to really like purple. Let's talk about that. <laughs> or how about this? What's up with that purple? You tend to like purple. Let's talk about that. It's very different ways. One opens up the door for, for communication, connection, potential partnership down the road, growth, evolution, great deliverables, and the other one shuts that door down. Have you ever had that experience where someone says something and you just bloop, shut down? No? No one's ever had that experience? OK, thank you. The third tool is a balancing act. So in parenting, um, there's something called the one to four balancing ratio, something like that. And it, it's really effective. Let me tell you something. My son puts down the toilet seat now all the time. It's huge and wonderful. What also happens is, because I've said one nice, one, one you're like, dude, you got to put down the toilet seat. And then the other four things, like, hey, good cleaning up, and whatever, the other four things, now he gets it. He gets it. Because in, and we are all kids at heart. I mean, aren't we? We all want to feel cheered on and yay and go you. So give me that one difficult thing and then give me four because that's an equal ratio. Even though one to four in math is not equal, in terms of feedback, it is. And so well, I don't mean that you need to say, um, uh, so uh, what's my example? <laughs> Have you considered how your tone of voice is affecting the situation? And by the way, you know, all in one conversation. You don't do it all in one, in all in one conversation. Um, this speaks to the, the, uh, the belief that um, uh, someone said to me recently, well, you know, whenever you're going to give um, uh, constructive feedback, you always start with the good. And I'm like, no, you don't. Everybody knows that trick now. Everyone's going, yeah, 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 where's the butt? Come on, give me the hard stuff. So, you know, treat us with intelligence. Be straight up. Listen, that, that meeting was awesome, and I want you to understand, I think your tone of voice was a little off there. There were some really good things in that meeting, and your tone of voice is kind of, mm, I don't know, I saw, I kind of winced a little bit. Let's be straight up about it. So I'm not going to snow you, I'm not going to BS you, I'm going to be straight up with you. That's being compassionate, it's treating others, it's do unto others. You know, it's basic Bible stuff. I'm not going to get all crazy religious on you. Um, so, and it doesn't even have to be within the same day. You can have that one conversation and then the next day say like, I'm hearing awesome things about your communication style, honey, or whatever it is. And, and keep it going so that there's definitely that ratio in your own mind and you will see amazing things. My son now tells his friends, Jaden, nice putting down the toilet seat because he's, it's, it's a ripple effect. It's trickling out. So you're gonna see your colleagues and your team start saying things to each other because even if they're not aware of it on a visceral level, they're feeling recognized in a good way and getting helpful constructive feedback. It's not all negative, negative, negative. All right, what's happening here? So, whoo, we got a boogie. Compassion will take you places you never imagined. Anybody here really need numbers to feel compelled about compassion? All right, I saw at least one hand, so good, we're gonna go for it. There's this man, Dennis Hay, who leads anger management workshops in New Zealand. Um, he works with um, court-ordered violent abusers, domestic violence. So that's a pretty intense um, population to work with. He teaches compassion workshops with them. He calls them core value, core, core value workshops. He had a group that he did a study on, 285 court-ordered abusers, and after a year, he did an analysis, and here's what he found. A 35% improvement in self-esteem. Self-esteem comes from loving yourself enough to be yourself. 35% improvement. Okay, is everyone sitting down? Are you ready for this next number? 250% increase in strategies to resolve anger and violent situations. If you can change a violent anger with compassion, imagine what you can do in the workplace. And strategic thinking comes from 
compassion. I didn't do this, this analysis. Dennis did. And thank, to, thank you to him, because I'm not good like this. So that's pretty compelling. And then, anyone ever experience anxiety? I was born with a mountain of anxiety, let me tell you. And most creatives I've ever met, we all carry little, little bags of anxiety with us wherever we go. It's one of our gifts that keeps us looking for more and more creative solutions. And it's pain in the butt. So here's the deal. 33% clinical anxiety reduced to normal level. I have no idea what normal means, but whatever. I'll take a 33% reduction in anxiety. Thank you very much. So there we go. Anxiety is reduced when you own your power. Now, I found this after I already wrote the Compassionate Management Three Principles, so don't think I backed into this. This backed into me. It was awesome. Be, trust, and own. What I want to do now is, um, if anyone wants to go up to the mics and give some examples where we can riff a little bit on bringing Compassionate Management to real-life situations, that would be wonderful. Anybody brave? Courageous? No. Oh, I see someone. Yay! What's your name? Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. So I have an associate who uh, so kind of resonated with me, the loving yourself enough to be yourself. He grapples with being himself at work and being himself outside of work. And ne'er the two shall meet. And so how do you... And it's caused issues with, you know, just he doesn't like to talk to people. He just likes to be told what to do and just kind of get things done. And, he, you know, he wants things to be in black and white. So how do you recommend coaching him to say, it, you need to be yourself. You need to stop living in two different worlds because how awful is that for you, first of all? <laughs> and, and it's reflecting in your performance. So you're saying that outside of work, you have witnessed him speaking on, of, you know, defending oh, yeah. himself and being himself and really being Well, when we go real. to happy hour, right? We're a team, so we go to happy hour. We're, with the team, he's comfortable. It's with the larger corporate environment. So we've got our, our production team, and he's, you know, we go to happy hour. We, you know, it's safe, I think, for him. And then when we talk to the corporate clients, that's when he starts to ah. just completely, it's a different person. So my, my gut. My head said one thing, my heart, no, seriously, my gut says fear. Um, fear plays a lot in the workplace. Anyone ever felt terrified you're going to lose your job and that you need to twist yourself into a pretzel to keep your job? I, I could raise like every possible hand and leg I ever had to do that one. Um, so one thing I would throw out is the idea of, of do you think he is jeopardizing his job? Okay, so he's heading towards jeopardizing his job by not um, using his own voice. And so what I would throw out there is, if you haven't already done this, having the heart-to-heart -heart of saying, what is it that's stopping you? Is it fear? Is it, and just, and doing that, um, that sitting on your hands thing and biting your tongue, have you tried that? reconcile the two. And so maybe it is a little fearful. And, and maybe it's something that's deeper than just what's happening at work. You know, like yeah. a, a couple of times I've caught that he doesn't trust emotion. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't validate it. And so because there have been a couple of comments that he's made about how someone feels. So it's almost like working on his compassion and his ability to trust compassion. So I guess that's maybe the root of the question is how do you help others see validation and being compassionate and knowing that how you feel is a very valid way of being. Wow, I think we need to bring a therapist in here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, Do you want, does anyone want to try to answer that? You have ideas? Yeah, I think, um, oh yeah, go ahead.
That's beautiful. I actually have a blog on that. <laughs> really. I mean, when, when I feel totally down and insecure, that's what I do now. That's what I have learned. I'm going to write down five things. I had an interaction with someone a few months ago, which, which spurred the blog, and I thought, oh my God, she is just trying to tear me down. For, some, for whatever reason, her insecurity was tearing me down, 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 and I was letting it, and then I thought, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm awesome. And I wrote the list of five things that I'm proud of about myself. I'm resilient, I'm self-aware, I'm whatever, you know. And, and it, 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 over, it made me feel a lot better. What ultimately happened with her? Right. Right, no, it's never black and white. I, I will give you one example of um, someone as, as, what's your name? Bree, thank you for your help. And when you were speaking, I realized there was somebody um, who I once managed who had this issue. And he was a manager, and he had to start managing, and he was not. And the whole team was falling apart because he was such an anti-manager. And um, we sat down, and I said, Honey, you've got the power. You can do it. And he was like, no, I can't. I really can't. And I said, yes, you can. So every time I'd walk by, I'd be like, you've got the power. Uh, uh, you know? And then, and what I really had to do with him was he couldn't have written those five things. For whatever reason, his childhood, whatever, blah, 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 he could not have written them. So I started identifying them for him and saying, Look at how you handled this situation. He'd be like, what? And I said, no, really, this shows that you have the ability to handle a difficult, it was like a tiny minor, but you know, that you have the ability. Now take that and really apply it. And I kept looking for those little moments, those little glimmers of like 1% of what I, he needed to be delivering and saying, not that it's 1%, but that look, you have the ability, you have the potential, do more of that. So that, because modeling wasn't helping this person, and threatening certainly wasn't going to help this person. He'd been threatened before I got there. Um, and so I tried that, that really identifying for him those things that Bryn, your person, was able to do on her own, but my person wasn't. So maybe that's where you are now. Maybe you need to, give, maybe you need to identify real-time moments of tiny successes. They might be tiny in your mind, but they're huge in your, in your colleague's mind, in your associate's mind, because he's not even able to, to see any of them. All right, next question. Hi. I was wondering if you have any suggestions for ways to get, I'm in a very hierarchical work environment, engineering company, small graphic design group, so. Let's all take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, We're here for you, honey. But we have a great employee development um, training group, and I've taken all these compassionate, emotional intelligence training classes, really successful with a group that was kind of, you know, not cohesive. Um, so I'm having great success. But awesome. above me are these people that don't deliver that to me. Right. And so I was wondering if there's ways to, and, and they don't trust employee development because they already are experts at everything. Right. So. <laughs> Anyone ever work with someone like that? <laughs> We'd all like put our entire arms and legs. So is there, is there some way to kind of enlighten upward? Um, this is a very, I, I experience this at every job I've ever had. And what I would say to you is, I don't believe that you can change people. They have to want to change themselves. What I will say for a situation like that that's worked well for me is to own my power. And even when they hand me, um, Ooh, I guess I can't really curse. I call it the HBOS, a hot bag of bleep. Um, when they hand me that hot bag of bleep, I used to hand it down just because that's very natural. Like, ew, get this, um, you know, feces off of me. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I also learned that wasn't helpful. That made me feel worse. Here I was, you know, defecating on someone else instead of... Um, and so what I really tried to do is to take compassionate management and take that hot bag and say, okay, you know what? How can I hand compassion back up so that I feel good? And how can I then turn that into compassion and hand it down? So even when I'm told, you need to do this project, Rena, I can say, oh, all right. Hey, 
Um, oh, manager, I was wondering, could you help me understand a little bit more deeply why it is that we're doing this, just so that I can get the buy-in from the team? What I really want to say is, are you freaking kidding me? This project makes no sense. But OK, I'm going to take the compassionate approach, because I want to keep my job. And I want to enjoy my day, because I was really, I mean, my tummy was tight for years, you know, that like, ugh, feeling. Um, so I needed to change it for me. So OK, how, can you share with me some of the information? Oh, yeah, I bet you need, I bet you need to get buy-in from the team. You know, that like bad-mouthing someone else that makes people like that feel better? Yeah, I do, I do. OK, get that information. And then I was able to really hand it down in a compassionate way. All right, listen, guys, I got the details. This is why we're doing it. Rena, do you think it makes sense? You know what, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not, maybe not. All right, but we still need to do it, so let's figure out how we're going to do it and, and be in this together. Without throwing anyone under the bus, without saying the boss is a total jerk, because that doesn't make me feel good either. So bringing compassion, and then sometimes I've seen it trickle up, but mostly not, because people are who they are, and they have to choose to want to shift towards compassion or kindness or nurturing or you know, truly seeing their colleagues um, at every level. And some people are just so insecure and have a lifetime of insecurity and have been rewarded for that, um, uh, I think, bad behavior over and over and over again as they move up the ladder that they think they need to keep doing that for the rest of their career. So they're too afraid to become really connected. That scares them. Is that helpful? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, patience, and, and, but mostly owning your power, that you can at all times be compassionate to yourself, even to that totally insecure person who was taught so wrong and just doesn't know any better. Um, it kind of it lessens the, the blow a little bit. All right, two more questions. Right Come up here. to the mic. Right, right here. Oh. Hello. Where? Hi. Oh, hi. I've been here a while. I'm so <laughs> my sorry. Name is hi, my name is Frances. Hi, Frances. I work in a corporate environment. Do you have any strategies for when a member of the team goes out on disability and you don't have the budget to hire contractors? So you want to, you know, the rest of the team has to pick up the slack, but you also want to respect where your, your colleague is out on disability who needs to heal. So. Any ideas on how to handle it? Have you had to handle that? Um, I think I need a little bit more specific. Um, are you having struggles with this right now? And what oh, are those struggles? Yeah, the rest of the team needing to pick up all the slack, not being able to get extra contract help. And, and they're resenting this a little person? Bit, yes, yes. And do you have any? Um, morale boosting things going on, which I know sounds forced and fake, but sometimes they work? Some, yes. <laughs> so here's the deal. Um, the truth is the most powerful thing. So if you have a team who's feeling resentful about someone who's out on disability, um, sometimes, it, and listen, you have to know your culture. Um, what I would, my gut is to go and bring the team together and say, all right, let's, can we just name the elephant in this room? Susie's out on disability. She needs to be. She doesn't want to be. Yeah, maybe she's sitting around playing on her iPad a lot and we're not, and that's a little bit annoying, but you know what? It is what it is. We can't control that. How we're going to deal with it internally with our attitudes, and I'm feeling a little bit of mm, something growing here, and I want to nip it in the bud. Let's talk openly, and let's figure out, is it not a fair uh, delegation of responsibilities? We also have to be careful. You don't want to open it up to everyone and have it be a, a bitch fest. Ooh, I cursed. Is that all right? Um, you, that, you, know, you, you don't want it to just be like a negative venting session. It needs to be a positive, productive session. And so if you're going to do it, you start by setting ground rules. Everything that's said in this room is safe. It doesn't leave this room, number one. Number two, there's no uh, bad idea in this room. Number three, we're going to respect each other's experiences. And you kind of set ground rules for mutual respect and compassion for the people in the room. And maybe you don't have the whole team. Maybe you only have like the top three. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have, maybe have a three-person team, then you have the whole room. Mm -hmm. If you have a 60-person team, you don't have all 60. So you have to decide who is the most pivotal, who can help shift that, that tone, because sometimes there's that bad apple you know, who's the grumbly one who gets the whole negativity going, then you have a, a shutdown conversation with that person. I don't mean shut down in, in a shaming, awful way, mm -hmm. but you have a, you know, it really is not helpful uh, conversation. 
But I think, I think That's dealing good. head that on helps. with the truth yeah. and, and getting there, empowering them to shift what's happening into a more positive way and coming up with solutions. That's good. Thank and you. And also, interns are awesome. <laughs> Unpaid interns. Lady in pink. Go ahead. Hi, Rina. Cecilia, how are you? Hi. Um, and I think that goes for all of us, um, how you keep your team inspired. When, for example, in a corporation like mine, we come way below sales, even legal, uh, marketing. We're the last ones there, and we're saving the world every single day. So how you keep them inspired and engaged and telling you you're a very important part of the company, and they have to believe it. So. Okay, I saw somebody clapping. I think we all need to clap for that question. Yes, we all experience that. We're the last ones on the chain, although production. Anyone from production here? I'm so sorry, because you are really the last ones on, right? Am I right? Yeah. Mm. Um, so how to be, keep inspired? I, wow, that's a tough one, and it's a really, really important one. Um, again, I think truth and honesty and, and authenticity, but positive authenticity. Sometimes I've seen people be like, yeah, well, I'm gonna tell that team the truth. Man, this sucks, guys, we're always getting last, you know, and that just pulls people down. So the, the positive authenticity, wow, this really sucks. Who wants to pull um, two bucks each and get a, a pizza tonight that we have to stay late? Um, and just sort of, it, it really is the manager's job to maintain an upbeatness, uh, a positivity, but only when it's authentic. It can't be fake, because everybody spots fake immediately. So there are some things um, that uh, some companies have done. You can definitely talk to Jackie Schaefer over there in the, in the pink, and she's speaking next, um, about morale task forces. And what this is something that you could do. When I was at Kenneth Cole, we, um, uh, we had a, a mail cart that we took around. Every, it was either every Friday or every other Friday, I can't remember. And it had like uh, Malamars or moon pies or something sweet and sugary and disgusting and yummy. And um, just somebody pushing it around every Friday uh, from, from cube to cube because none of us really wanted to stop and have a forced fun time for two hours or have like an offsite, we all love each other, team building, blah, blah, blah. We had a lot of work to do. We had lives outside. Even when we, when we played with each other, when we had you know, fun, we went out with drinks for each other, we just wanted to be. You know, we didn't want to have to like get along. Um, and so, so it, this was this totally, um, <clears throat> it didn't interrupt the day, excuse me, uh, in a truly intrusive way, but it was a fun, 15 minutes, like, uh, what it, somebody once told me that they used to throw marshmallows at each other over their cubes, and whomever got the most marshmallows in some basket won a, a stuffed animal or something. So coming up with ways to, to keep, what, do you all know TED? TED Talks, the TED Sessions? How many people know TED? Okay, anyone who didn't have their hand up, go to TED Talks, Technology Entertainment Design, they're free. Um, you can get a three-minute session or a 20-minute session, and it takes you out of your cubicle. It's so inspiring. Definitely watch Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. My stroke of insight has nothing to do with creativity and everything to do with creativity. Um, and so just doing things outside of the job without forcing it on you is what I've seen keeps creatives inspired um, and motivated because it brings fun into the office without making them stay late or putting in extra um, money or anything like that. Is that helpful? Okay, great. So we have 10 more minutes. Um, I'm gonna just fly past these. Oh wait, this is a pretty important one. <laughs> All right, I'll go back. Um, you can twist yourself to a pretzel, but I really wouldn't recommend it. Modeling, not twisting yourself to a pretzel, especially for the woman, you know, who was it? Uh, I forgot your name. Yes, so for Stephanie, if Stephanie modeled the um, not speaking up, that would be a problem. So for her colleague, she needs to model owning herself and, and being herself and being true. And so that's all I'm gonna say on that. Um, although I will say, I have a note up here because it's pretty darn terrifying to be yourself and you can share this with your colleague. It's pretty darn terrifying to be yourself because when you're truly yourself, like let's say all of you in this room walked out of here and went, Man, she was a dud. You'd be rejecting me. 
because I am fully me here. If I came up and I did some presentation, kind of pretending to be someone else, you'd be rejecting that someone else. But I'm putting me out here, so you're rejecting me, or you're embracing me. And that's the fear of being yourself out, I mean, anywhere, you know, outside of work also, going on a date, you know? So being yourself at work is pretty terrifying because the potential for rejection is so huge. But here's the deal, and here's something that you can use with, with colleagues like Stephanie's. You're either choosing to reject yourself or love yourself. That's a choice you're making. There is no in-between. If you, if you reject yourself in the office and you love yourself outside, you're really, bottom line, rejecting yourself. You know, who you are, is that really how you want to live your life? I told you I'm woo-woo. Next, the gut. Um, as you know, and here's the key point is, it's not always an obvious solution, and it might not even be a solution you want, but when your head and your heart come together and spit out a solution, it is really the right path to take. The more you hone your ability to really listen to your gut and your intuition, the more um, success you'll have in life, I would say. And number three, when you own your power and you embrace compassionate management, here are three points I really want to make. You, ima you imagine a, a, a boss who does this, someone who listens between the words to really understand what is being communicated, someone who is kind, clear, and direct, so no one wastes time and energy. You know all that posturing and proving and guessing what do I need to do to be okay? All of that goes away when you have a boss who is really clear and kind and direct with you. There's no more guesswork. And someone who knows that the more we connect with each other, the more trust builds and the more power plays disappear. And here's a sentence I really want you to think about. Did you know that eliminating power plays allows the team to focus on the worked product and not on politics? Start identifying how much of the day is on politics. When I um, first became a manager, after about a year of it, I, I remember literally sitting at my desk with my head in my hands thinking, oh my God, my job is now 80% politics and 20% doing work. And the higher up I got, the more, or the less <laughs> work I got to do, the more politics I did. Is anyone experiencing that? The more compassion you can bring, the more clear, kind, and direct communication you can bring, the more trust and connection you bring, the less power plays there are because people aren't spending time guessing and wondering and posturing. It's pretty powerful stuff. The Dalai Lama said, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. For a man who's been in exile for over 50 years, God bless him. If he can do it, we can do it. And here is really what I want to close on. Um, there have been many times in my career where I've had to jump off a cliff. I mean, I haven't had to, but I've wanted to. I happen to be a smart risk taker. And so I've jumped and jumped and jumped, and each time I've been terrified. Um, this is a, a quote that I've carried in my head and in my heart constantly, because if Michael Jackson can miss 9,000 shots in his career, Michael Jackson, Ooh, sorry. <laughs> and good morning, everybody, there we go. Michael Jordan, certainly Michael Jackson's missed a few. Ooh, Michael Jordan. It's a good thing I have it up there, so I can just, you know, read it. Anyway, uh, 9,000 shots, and he's still as successful as he is, then I will tell you that in my career, and I say this because um, I don't know that this applies to this audience, because you all seem very comfortable with the concept of compassion, but a lot of people I present to think like, whoa, she's so woo-woo, kumbaya, crystal, we're all going to have a big group meditation, blah, blah, um, which I could do if you wanted. If you're interested, we could. Um, <laughs> But that for myself, I have always done what Sheryl Sandberg is calling leaning in, and it's terrifying, and what Michael Jordan has done, and leaning in and going for greatness, because for me, when I have fallen on my face, which I have done many, many times, and I'm sure I will do it again, it's much better for me than falling on my butt. At least I went for greatness, and at least I tried. And so that is how I will close this session and say thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate it. Thank you.